written many, many, many great works of fiction and nonfiction. Um, his travel books include uh, great, uh, The Great Railway Bazaar, which really um, transformed American travel writing and, and set a whole new tone and sort of landscape for that. I personally, as a travel writer, feel enormously indebted to him for that book alone. Um, but the great Ghost Train to the Eastern Star, which, which reprised the journey that he took to write um, Great Railway Bazaar, Dark Star Safari. Um, his novels include uh, The Mosquito Coast, Hotel Honolulu, and The Lower River. Um, Paul Theroux is just an amazing writer. I admire him for so many reasons, and we'll probably talk about some of them tonight, but the precision of his prose, his intrepidness, his scholarship, uh, and his just straightforward approach to telling it like it is, telling what he's seeing, telling what he's thinking. His honesty is incredibly um, refreshing and empowering for, for me as a writer and editor. It's very inspiring. Um, I, one of the things I do, one of the hats I wear these days is I'm the book review columnist for National Geographic Traveler. Every, every month I choose a book of the month. My column this month was just published, and uh, the book of the month happens to be, <laughs> amazingly enough, The Last Train to Zona Verde, which is an amazing book. And in, in the course of that review, I say something that I very, very sincerely believe, which is that Paul Theroux is the greatest American travel writer of our time. And it's a huge, huge pleasure to be in conversation with him tonight, and so I give you Paul Theroux. Yeah. Thank you very much for showing up and such. Thank you, it's very nice to be back here. Um, and thank you, Don, for such a kind introduction. Do we, um, I'm not sure how this works, but, do, are you, we, we each have we each Anyway, have. may I just say, um, one of the delights of uh, writing a book and going on a book tour such as this is to see people like you showing up at a bookstore. I've said before, this is because Reading, and reading paper books is um, an activity that, that isn't that isn't practiced by everyone. <laughs> when I see a group like this, it's like early Christians it's like <laughs> early meeting meeting secretly <laughs> because we all have one thing in common: a love of the written word. Yeah. Huh? So we're all meeting together. You know, you talk to people all the time. You don't meet people who read. You are all secret readers. <laughs> and you're here, we have this, the word, the book, in common. So thanks very much for showing up. <laughs> now, no, keep reading. <laughs> So, uh, Paul, I wanted to begin just by, I'm, I'm imagining that most of you have not yet had the great pleasure of reading Paul's book, so I'm going to ask for a little bit of background about the new book. Um, can you talk about why you decided to undertake this journey, the genesis of it? Yes, that's easy. Uh, I first went to Africa, um, I joined the Peace Corps in 1963, and, uh, and my Peace Corps friends here? No. Yes, we have uh, Okay. Uh, Mike Lawman, are you here? Mike? Mike is in the back. Okay. Mike and I joined the Peace Corps 50 years ago. 50 years ago, in the summer of 63. For 50 years. We were 12. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot of the, uh, the former uh, the Peace Corps people live in the Bay Area, uh, like Mike and a number of others. And um, so. We joined in 63. At that time, Africa was becoming decolonized. And uh, Zambia didn't, was, didn't exist. We went to a country called Nyasaland. It was not yet to become Malawi. Um, and and there, a number of other countries, uh, Botswana was, was Bechuana land, and so forth and so on. So it was, it was a time of British Africa. We went to Africa at a time when it was a colony. The, the, these were still British colonies. In, in the case of uh, Nyasaland, it was a territory. 
So we, we witnessed the transformation from old Africa, from colonial Africa, to the Africa that you see now. 50 years, I mean, it seems like it's, it's amazing. But um, we've seen this transformation. Some countries look better, others not so great. But still, if you're a certain age, you see how the world works. The world doesn't go, it's not some steady progress upward. It, it's hard to tell young people who see the world, see the stock market rising, or, you know, prosperity. It's hard to explain to them that things fall apart, that sometimes things just end, they, and they end horribly. They end in, 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 in war, in massacre, in failure, in dictatorship. So we've seen that. Uh, so you ask, why did I go back? I've been watching and visiting and revisiting Africa for 50 years. And I thought, I wrote, um, how many of you have read Dark Star Safari? So quite a few. OK, well, this is, you'll, then you'll be very interested. Um, that I wrote that book as a return to Africa, but we returned with, it, with an intention of writing about it. When you're, you know, the difference between a, a, a vacation and travel is Vaca you don't take notes on vacations. You just sit there. As people say to me, relax, Paul, just relax. I, think, I, don't, want, I don't want to relax. You know, just shut up, I'm writing something down. <laughs> I don't even like vacations. Uh, I very seldom take vacations. And I, I, when people say relax, I, you know, I, I can relax at home. I live in Hawaii, for God's sake. I wouldn't go, go, go to Africa to relax. <laughs> So I wrote Dark Star Safari, which as you know, is an overland trip from Cairo to Cape Town. And when I got to Cape Town that time, um, which was in, uh, it was 2001, it, it was after 9-11, uh, I thought, I, I, I had, it was a, a hell of a trip. As you know, I got shot at, I got insulted, I was starved, I was thirsty, I was sleeping under a truck for a couple of nights. You know, it was just all, uh, parts of it awful, but all of it, you know, great in the retelling. And I thought, I want to go back, I want to uh, go back to Cape Town, see how Cape Town had changed, because Cape Town was sort of, uh, South Africa itself was, it was sort of on a knife edge. People were clamoring for jobs. It's a prosperous place, South Africa. And it, in many respects, a, a great place. I thought, I want to go back, see how it changed. And then a country that had been on my radar almost since we were in, when we went to uh, in the Peace Corps in 63, 65, um, I used to think of, we were right next to Mozambique, but I used to think about Angola. Angola basically was at war from the early 60s until the 90s. So they had 27 years of, of war. And Angola always represented to me the great green heart of Africa. But a colony, it had been a colony for hundreds of years. <clears throat> hundreds of years. So you think, a place is a colony for hundreds of years. What does a colonizing power do in hundreds of years? You know, you could, the, the imperial power, Portugal in this case, what do they do? What kind of roads? What kind of schools? What do they do? How do they, how does it operate? So anyway, um, so you asked, why I wanted to return and I wanted to continue. And the other thing was that if, if Angola, as a place that had existed in my mind as a place to go, there were people in Botswana and Namibia, of course they call the Bushmen, they're not Bushmen, or even San people, they call the Johansi or the Kong people. And I wanted to see them. They're, the, they're our earliest ancestors, the hunter gatherers of South Africa. And I, I wanted to see, meet them, talk to them. You see them on streets in, in South Africa. I glimpsed them. Nelson Mandela is, has that ancestry. You can see in his face, Nelson Mandela is, is part sand people, the office of the sand ancestry. And so I wanted to see these people. So, you know, people take trips because they have a secret desire, the name of a place, the imagery of the place, uh, and they have time. So. It's all of those, you know, very simple desires, but I fulfilled by that one. Uh, Africa has become really a touchstone for you, it, se it seems to me at least. And um, I'm wondering, did Africa call you even before you went into the Peace Corps? Or 
was it just chance that you went to Africa as your Peace Corps assignment and then Africa got under your skin and became a part of your life? Uh, that's a great question. It, um, most Peace Corps volunteers could say that when they were assigned to a place, you can verify this, did you choose the place or did the place choose you? Did you, you chose it? When I was in Italy teaching um, in the summer of 1963 and I got a letter from the Peace Corps saying, you've been assigned to go to Niasaland. I had to go to a map to find out where Niasaland was. <laughs> where were you in the Peace Corps? Thailand. In Thailand. And they called it Thailand. Uh, Thailand. Thailand. <laughs> Did you dream about Thailand before? No. You, know, you were thinking of Turkey or something. I was thinking of South America. South America. Okay. <laughs> but that's the way it happens. And Mike, were you thinking of Africa? Probably not. Yes? Yeah. Okay, he was. I wasn't. I, I actually, uh, I thought in the 60s that my, uh, my dream was Lebanon, Turkey, the Middle East. I thought mm -hmm. I would really like to go to the Middle East. I thought about Africa, but it was so far off from where I came from. So expensive. I come from a very family of modest means. The idea of getting on a plane and going to Africa was the furthest thing. I, I mean, I, I, I had read Hemingway. Um, and, uh, you know, Tarzan comments about it. Tarzan stories about it. But I didn't know anything about it. I knew about um, the, uh, the Congo independence and, uh, and Lumumba and the killing of Lumumba and the, the independent, his speech. I remember his speech. He said, We're not your monkeys now. <coughs> and the Belgians you know, fell back. It's a great book about. Um, the Congo by a local author, Adam Hawkshaw, King Leopold's Ghosts. I highly recommend it. So I didn't think about that. I, I, uh, I was sent to Africa, and I joined the Peace Corps because if I hadn't, I would have been drafted and I would have ended up in Vietnam. And so I would, you know, every trip is flight and pursuit. I was fleeing the draft and pursuing what a Jungian would call individuation. I wanted to find out who I was and what I wanted. I wanted to get away from my family. I wanted to get away from my neighborhood, my town. I just wanted, I wanted very, very much to get away. And it was a happy accident that I ended up in the middle of, of Africa because I, I had a subject. And I found out that you know, I could write and I, and I wanted to write. Did you find out who you were? I, you know, I'm still working on that. Right? <laughs> uh, but I, you know, when you're at home, uh, people, if you say uh, you want to be a writer, people just throw obstacles. They say, well, what are you going to write? Who's going to publish it? Who's going to read it? And people ask you all these stupid questions. <laughs> you need to go to a place where, uh, you're not, you know, people discover it. They, it, it. To become a writer, you need to... This process of individuation is uh, is very important because you can't, in order to do what you want to do, you have to get away from people who are, uh, ask you questions to which you don't have the answer. You don't know. You don't know. Someone says, you're going to be a writer. I don't know. If, if you ask me now, what am I writing? I, I, I happen to be writing something at the moment. I don't know what it is. My wife asked me the other day, she said, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. <laughs> this woman whom I, I love for more than 20 years now, and I can't tell her what I'm doing. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I hope it turns into something. It's fiction, but I don't know. So all of us have, you know, there's, there's, what, there, there's what we're doing, and then there's our dream. And I used to think this in England, that people had two lives. They had the life that they were leading, and then they had a dream. They had, uh, and sometimes you ask someone, what do you do? And they'd say, you know, I own a news agent shop. And then, and then you talk to them around and they'd say, well, what I've always wanted to do is this. What I've always, and they would, there'd be two people operating on two levels. The thing that you're doing and the thing that you, you dream about doing. So, but you only, you tell that to very few people. And being a writer, it's, it's very vulnerable. It, it, you feel vulnerable, even now more so because Bookstores are a vanishing species, you know, and, 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 and th 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 this bookstore is a rare thing. A bookstore full of people like you is a rare thing. This is, and, and it's becoming rarer. There may become a time, you know, God help you, I, I hope it doesn't happen, when there are no bookstores. It may happen. There are towns that have no bookstores. 
bookstores are closing, the chains are closing. So it depends, but in order to, to sustain it, uh, it's very difficult. So to say, in a place where there's no bookstores, where the library is closed, or the library is full of DVDs, I want to be a writer. It's like saying, I want to be an alchemist. <laughs> Or, or you just keep it to yourself. You're not allowed to say it. I like that. I, I want to be an alchemist. <laughs> That's going to be my new line now. If you ask. Um, so, what do you remember the moment when you suddenly thought, "I can be a writer. I can do this." Um, not exactly. It's not a moment, but there. But I do remember. And uh, there was a, a magazine published in. Rhodesia, Southern Rhodesia, as it was called at the time, called the Central African Examiner. And I wrote a, a poem when I was in Malawi, and in 1960, June 1964, I published it. That I, I sent. It. I remember. I used to write for the magazine now and then, anonymously, because we weren't supposed to publish things. But this poem appeared under my own name, and I thought. I mean, I in college I published it, but I was a pre-med student. I was a science. I was headed for medical school. Um, so I wasn't an English major. I was, you know, a science, and I'm still science-minded. But I published this poem in 64. So you say, is there a moment? I had the secret, the secret that I want to be a writer, but it's, uh, you know, you, I didn't tell people. But when I published that poem, it was called, it was about an old car that I'd seen just bouncing through the bush. And, and an African was driving this car. It was an old jalopy. Just driving through the door. It was a place where most of the people were on bikes. So it was just a, a poem about this old car <coughs> going through the bush. And um, when that poem appeared, I thought, maybe someone believes in me. You know, I didn't, my family didn't. I mean, I, I, I didn't really tell them that much, but I come from a large teasing family. They would have said, oh, well, you want to be Herman Melville? They would, make, they would have made jokes about it. So I, you know, I know even now they make jokes. But, but when that, when that poem, when, when you, everyone needs encouragement. Everyone, no matter what age you are, if you're doing something, you need someone to say, that was good. Uh, I hope you write another one. I hope you do it again. Everyone needs it. No one can work in a vacuum. No one can work, you know, um, in a garret, just scribbling away, Thomas Chatterton, that sort of thing. You, you, it, it may happen that people do that, but most of us humans need someone to support us, to pat us on the back and say, that was worth something. So that, I remember it was June 64. I, you know, I, there are certain dates in my mind, like March, May 30th, 1981, when I stopped smoking. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a certain the, the, the chronology in my mind, but I do remember that. Yeah, that's great. Well, we're all here to encourage you. You should keep writing. <laughs> well, I, thank, thank you very much. I, 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 I have plenty of encouragement. But, but, but I think what I'm saying is, if someone says to you, I want to be a writer, they're revealing something in a moment, you know, you could you could um, lose them in a minute if you mock them, tease them. So they need, you know, they, they really need it. On the other hand, you know, uh, I've been at occasions like this when um, a parent has come up and said, uh, "That's my son back there. I'd like you to read something he wrote." And I think, well, okay, I'll read it, but he'll never become a writer as long as you're. Uh, yeah. Take his manuscripts around. He needs to go away. He needs to rebel. He doesn't. You shouldn't read his things. He needs to do it himself or she, whatever. Do you know what I mean? You can't. Your parents should shouldn't be your advocates. They need to be. They need to encourage you. But then you have to go off and do it yourself. I emphasize that because I found it so hard. It's always been so hard to be a writer in history. So hard to get published to find readers. Uh, it, 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 even now, I, you know, I've been very lucky and very well rewarded in my career, but I don't take it for granted. It's a very difficult thing, and more difficult now that, that print is scarce, that, that books are scarce, that uh, it's, it's like an ancient form, even, you know, the idea that, I, I still write in longhand. Some people say, well, I write, you know, I, I've got a pen here, you know, and, and a notebook, and, and that's how I write, uh, with my, you know, pen in my notebook. 
well, this is the, you know, I'm like a hunter-gatherer. <laughs> oh, what is that thing? It's a pen, my God, what do you do with that? <laughs> the idea of writing with a pen, you know, it's just amazing. Um, but some people still do it. What I, what I say is that, uh, yeah, the, the encouraging part of it, um, I would say also, the further answer to your question is, I knew I wanted to be a writer when I started to read and read books that I loved, and I thought I'd love to be able to do that. You know, so reading has to come first. Yeah. I, I think it's so hugely inspiring to to hear what you just said. And one of the things I always tell my students is that whoever your hero author is, at one point in their life, they were unknown. They never published anything in their lives. They were absolutely unknown, and now. It's so great to hear, I mean, the amazing Paul Theroux remembering the first poem that he had published and what an impact it had on you. I just think that's a great lesson that we can all kind of take away. Well, I, I, the footnote is the people who published it didn't know me. And the people who read the poem had no idea who I was. I, I, th this magazine appeared in southern Rhodesia. I was living in Malawi. And I said, so I'd never met the people who read the magazine. I didn't know anyone who had a subscription to this magazine. So I was. You know, the, uh, I was a person living in the bush, sent the poem, and there it was. Yeah. And I'm not a poet, you know, I, I just, but it was something I wrote, I wrote everything. The idea that someone didn't know me, but they, they saw this thing that I had written. Right. And valued that, that's what mattered to me, that they yeah. didn't, and it wasn't a friend of the family, it wasn't somebody I know, it was a stranger who read it. Yeah. And that's important. It's independent validation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what is it that drives you to write? Now, I think it eases that to see things as they are is a way to be free. To see things as they are. You say, oh, I'm this great guy. Clinton was a statesman. Bush is a rat. Obama's our savior. The Soviet Union was a man. You know, that people have these cliches. Now, we all know there's a grain of truth in it. But who are they really? What is the world really? What is it? And to, to see the world as it is, the subtleties of it, that there are no saints, there are no villains. It's not a question of good and evil. There's, those aspects are within us. And to see them and to understand them, to see that the texture, the detail of the world, as it is, as it is, not as, it want, want, as you want it to be. I lived for a long time in, in England, and people used to come to England, and they would describe what they had, T, saw this, Dickensian. And I think, you've read too many books. You've been reading Dickens. You've been reading Henry James. You've been reading Ford Bannock Ford. It's not like this. You don't understand. This is, in part, a violent place. This is a place where people pay taxes, where they fail their driving tests, where they, their kids are trying to get into school, where they get beat up on Saturday after football games. You know, it's not tea on the lawn. It's a subtle. So I wrote The Kingdom by the Sea as a result of that. I thought. It's not merry old England. It's a, you know, I was thinking, I wrote a piece for the website, the Daily Beast website, the other day. It appeared yesterday or the day before about Boston. Did you read it? I did. Yeah, okay. Sorry. And what it's about is, there was a bomb in Boston. It was horrible, horrible. But I lived for 20 years in England when there was a bomb every month. If it wasn't in London, then it was in Birmingham. If it wasn't in Guildford, then it was in Belfast. In Enniskillen, 29, uh, 11 people were killed. 29 people were killed in Omar. And hundreds maimed. It went on. It went on and on. Bailing uh, IRA bombs, but also uh, the other side. People were shot. Nail bombed. Whatever you can, I mean, it, it seemed like uh, the whole place was being bombed. So I wrote this piece, it was on the Daily Beast, about what it's like to live in a place, not where there's one bomb and three people are killed, but where if people are regularly bombed, where there's always a, uh, a, a, a metal detector, where everyone's bag is always searched, whether you're going to a church or a museum or wherever. So that's not Mary England, that's not Dickensian, that's not Henry James having cucumber sandwiches. That is, there was a war on, and, and you know, it was on until in, into the 90s, right? So I wrote, the, I wrote the piece. Probably not the most popular piece, but it's the way things are. Was, and I thought when I, uh, that you need, you were asking about why I write now, it, to see things as they are 
makes you free. To write them down makes you reach conclusions about them. Sometimes when you read a book, when I read a book, I write in the, in the, on the back page of the book what I think of the book. Or, you know, I, I try to reach a conclusion. It's an intelligent, civilized thing to have an experience and then to try to encapsulate that, to say, what happened? What just happened to me? People used to write letters and, um, and they'd say, an interesting thing happened to me yesterday, and they would write three pages before emails. Well, sometimes people write long emails on the same subject. But I write to give order to my life and to, to see things as they are. I mean, I had to repeat them, but, that, but it's, you know, to live my life. It, at once upon a time, it was to, it, I, I was writing to pay my kids' school fees, to pay off a whole, you know, th that's not the case anymore. So that's not a, that's not a feature, but it's, um, and it's not necessarily to entertain the troops, but it's, it's actually, to, uh, it's a form of, I suppose, meditation, um, uh, and, and it's to give order to things. If you can't be a writer, then you're a reader. And reading is, is, is all of you are readers, or else you wouldn't be here. Reading is the most civilized things you can do, you can do. And um, and when you read a book, you don't just toss it aside. You think, what was? Why did I buy that book? Was did it satisfy me? Am I going to read another book by that author? You know that it's 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 a uh, it's a mark of of. Um, of wit, of intellect, and of the, the civilized mind that, you, that you're doing it. I'm not saying that there are uncivilized people, but um, that's that's the motivator. So when people say, you know, my wife had a friend, she, we were having um, a meal, and she said, have you read Harry Potter? And I said, you know, I really haven't read it. And I said, what business is she? She said, I'm in, you know, she, her daughter knows my wife. My wife's in the public relations business. This is a person who's concerned with um, gourmet food. I said, have you had the uh, Taco Bell seven layer burrito? Burrito. Yeah. 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 No. I said, I would no more read a bad book than you would eat a burrito. I said, it's no, not that I, I'm using Harry Potter, so cliche, generic. I'm sure it's, it's great. But well, why would you? I mean, if you're <laughs> so people who wouldn't eat a Taco Bell seven layer burrito would read a bad book, you know? So I, that my point is, I, I would. I mean, life's too short. You're not going to spend your time doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you landed in Africa for your new book, what was? Did, did you have a sense of what you were hoping to accomplish, or what you thought might happen to you, or were you a blank slate, or how were you? I arrived. <laughs> Don George is a travel writer, and so he's asking me this. Is a, 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 he knows the answer to this question. You go, <laughs> you go to a place hoping that something will happen. Just praying to God that you're spared, that your life is spared, and that you meet someone who tells you a story, who's a good person, who's a helpful person. You hope you'll stay out of trouble, or if there's trouble, you'll get through it and have a tale to tell. That You just hope for the best. You hope for the best. It's not a plan. When I'm traveling, uh, I arrived there, and I had, I was actually, uh, had some people laughing. They said, what have you got? I said, oh, it was the, uh, the driver. And he said, I said, why are you laughing? He was dropping me at the bus station. He said, because you have a one-way ticket on a bus to Namibia. I said, yeah. He said, when are you coming back? I said, I don't know. Why is it so funny? He said, because you have a one-way ticket. <laughs> I said, you know, life is a one-way ticket. You're, you're, you're just heading into the wild going and, and hoping, but I really have no plans for coming back. I'm just hoping that I can just, I can keep going. So I was hoping uh, to have uh, an enlightening, <laughs> you know, an adventurous, or uh, an, eventful, an eventful passage from Cape Town to as far north as I could possibly get, right? Into into the northern Angola, which is a part of Africa you hadn't explored before. No, I really wanted to go to Angola. It's it, it's big. It's green. It uh, you know it gave us everything. It, uh, a, a great deal. A great number of African Americans can trace their ancestry to Angola. Many to West Africa. Many to Angola. Angola. 
was exporting slaves in the 16th century, early 16th century, to Brazil. And I, I mentioned this in the book, but I was in a bar and uh, uh, I was with an Angolan uh, Ovimbundu man, and he, I, he said, you want something to eat? I said, yeah. He said, what, peanuts? I said, yeah, I get some peanuts, but I'll have a beer. So he, he said to the, the waiter, uh, uh, cerveja and jinguba. I said, did you just say guba? He said, yeah. The word guba is a Kimbundu word meaning peanut. Well, guba, guba. So um, there are many words. The word banjo is from a, a Kimbundu word, banza. So we have a we have a link with Angola, and um, it's a cultural link, it's a historical link, and it's been a hidden place. Angola was col was colonized by convicts from Portugal. It was sent, it was a penal colony in the 16th century up till in, into the 19th century. They just sent convicts, murderers, rapists, poisoners. They sent them there, the dregs of, of, of Portugal. They didn't send women. So, you know, it wasn't like Australia, where was, if, if you were caught picking someone's pocket in, you know, 19th century London, you were put on a hulk and sent to Botany Bay and so on. Men and women who stole or committed crimes because they were hungry or poor. Uh, poverty were uh, driven, desperation, and they ended up in Australia. So Australia was, uh, the early colonizers were convicts, but a different category of convict from Angola. Angolans were, uh, were, were the dregs of society, but anyway, and they were bad people, and they became the slavers. They, they, they were, you know, were criminals who worked off their sentence and then stayed there, and then became um, slave masters. So, you know, it's not a glorious history, but it's a it's a, it's a very interesting history. And I may say that um, in about 2006-2007, China sent uh, colonists, <laughs> workers, uh, and artisans to Angola, and all of them were convicts. All of them were convicted criminals who lived on ships. They went ashore, they built buildings, and, and China said, you can work off your sentence here in Angola and then stay here, we don't want you. So they, they, it was basically uh, forced labor of, uh, of Chinese criminals. Now, more recently, they sent, they sent women, but the, the first Chinese workers, and it was only, you know, as they say, as recently as 2006 or seven, were um, convicted criminals. Echoing the earliest um, uh, Portuguese colonizers. Of, of the experiences that you had on, on your journey, what are the ones now that really, say one or two, that really stand out for you as the most impressive, the most moving, the ones that stay in your mind? That's a tough one. You've got to read the book. To, to, but, I, but okay, in summary, really the most vivid experience anyone can have in travel is crossing a border, crossing a frontier, walking across the border. A year ago, um, the New York Times asked me if I wanted to go to the Cote d'Azur, you know, Costa del Sol, Brazil, or where. And I said, I'd like to go, I'd like to walk from Arizona into Mexico, through, from Nogales, Arizona, to Nogales, Mexico. And I took a little convincing, but I, I wrote the story. It's probably on the New York Times website, Nogales, border town. Because the first time I saw it, uh, I saw a 40-foot steel fence, and I was in Arizona, and I looked, and I could not see Mexico. It's a, it was a big, rusted, rusty fence, 40 feet high, with, with razor wire at the top. As far to the left, east, and to west, it was the wall. It, it, it was the border of Arizona. I had never seen such a thing. You can, you can travel the world, I tell you, Vietnam into China, India into Pakistan, uh, you know, Egypt into the Sudan, Brazil into Uruguay, wherever, and you will not see a big wall, a big steel wall. Maybe uh, the Berlin Wall at one time, but I mean, that's a different story. That's across the city. This is a, a national frontier. That's a wall with a door in it, <laughs> a turnstile. So you can look it up. I mean, uh, um, I haven't reprinted it, but. 
the experience of being in an American city, Main Street, USA, and parking, I parked my car, and I went and showed my passport to the guy, the policeman, on our immigration guy on our side. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to there. He said, why? Why are you going there? I said, I'm just going to check it out. I said, haven't you been there? He said, I wouldn't go there. <laughs> He's 10 feet away from Mexico. There's a door in the wall. And he thinks it's like going through the looking glass. And, well, it is. It is. You walk, walk across from a town in Arizona to Mexico. There's music playing. You can smell food. There's The traffic's different. And by the way, they're making a lot of stuff for us and throwing tomatoes and everything else. And you just, I just with my back in my hand, I walked into Mexico. So you say, what the most vivid experience was going from Namibia into Angola, or going South Africa into Namibia, or going from Namibia into Botswana. That, that's, the, that's an amazing experience. But the idea that we can do it here, it's not like Tijuana is slightly different. I've been down to Tijuana, uh, you know, San Diego, and it's not like going to Canada. But I'm telling you, several friends of mine, Michael included, have been there, and it's it's just astonishing because when you're there, you take ten steps through the turnstile and go in. You meet people who are thrown out of the states, who are trying to get into the states but can't, and they're looking. And they can hear music, hear rock and roll, or whatever it is, uh, playing in Arizona. They can smell the food, they can hear the traffic, they can see planes landing, and they can't go there. And and there are people in Arizona who wouldn't go to Mexico to save their life. I mean, they, they would say it's dangerous, it's horrible. Actually, it was a, it's a wonderful place. The food's great there, the people are very friendly, and they're, they're there behind the fence, behind the big steel fence. It's just, it's, you know, it's almost a metaphysical experience, but it, it, it's the classic travel experience. Anyone can have it. You go, drive there, park your car, walk across, buy a funny hat, walk back, or get your teeth clean. Get your teeth, I got my teeth white. There's a big industrial area, so this is so sad. So you were saying, what's the vivid experience? It was crossing a border. And in life, we cross borders. We're always making a passage from one phase of our life into another phase. You get a divorce, you have a child, someone dies. You're crossing a border, you're crossing a frontier. Things aren't the same on the other side of that frontier. Something has happened, Some, something dramatically off-altered in your life. That's a frontier. Travel prepares you for that. It's, you know, it's not like you're not in Kansas anymore. It's more like through the looking glass. You don't know, you can see the door you walk through, and it's different. And you're a different person. Maybe you're more yourself because you've gone across that border. That's the first thing I would mention. And I, I, it's, it's important. You read Travel for Enlightenment. And that was very enlightening. I mean, when I went to Angola, people were insulting me. <laughs> they were, you know, senor, senor, mister, mister, and all of that, which you get everywhere. But I was being pestered, harassed, insulted. Okay, that's makes a good story. The second thing was, when I got into Angola, a vivid memory, I was in a car, I said to a guy, can you get me to this place? He said, yeah, and he loaded up the car with people. There were about eight of us in the car. Predictably, the car broke down. <laughs> and it was sundown on a very hot, dusty day. But the dust, you know, at the end of the day, the dust settling, and you think, we used to have these days in Malawi, end of the day, the dust, the sun setting, it's going to be dark, the lights are bad, you know, at the end of the day, the curtain comes down, it won't come up again tomorrow, until tomorrow morning, and you think, okay, I'll start again tomorrow. But just before nightfall, an old woman came up. I say old, she was probably younger than me, but in Africa, people age markedly. So, I'm, I'm turning 70 then, and uh, she's probably in her, she might have been, 58, I don't know, she seemed rather elderly. And she had a bucket and a pair of tongs. And she came up and she showed me the bucket. And she said, frango, chicken. And I looked in and there were three pieces of chicken that I could see covered with flies. <laughs> and there were, in fact, there were so many flies I could barely see the chicken. There was a flies. And she had these tongs and she was 
she worked it, you know, <laughs> and then she said, wow, which one? Which one do you want? And I thought, now there's a choice. <laughs> so, uh, which one? Which one? I said, no, I don't want to. Obrigado, no, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll take them away. So she started walking away, and I was thinking, well, the guys that were in the car were all drunk under a tree. The sun's going down, and I'm starving. So I did what we, anyone would do with that. I said, please come back. I said, I'll, I'll take that one. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the one with the fewest number of flies. <laughs> so I took it, and I started a fire. I, I heated it up in the fire and ate it. And then, um, and then got in, sat in the car, went to sleep in the car. You know, something. I past retirement age, I've written 40 books. I, I live in Hawaii. I'm sleeping in the front seat of a car in a benighted town in Angola, Hawaii. Anyway, uh, so I said, then the next morning she, she came back and she said, you know, same bucket, two, two pieces of chicken, <laughs> but the same number of flowers. And wow, which one? So I said, okay, I'll take that one. <laughs> Now, it so happened that in this uh, very, very small place, and it, it was uh, south of Lubango, in, in South Angola, I heard drumming in the night. And it turned out, this is a long story, it's in this book, but I said, what, what's that drumming? I asked a guy, and he said, oh, they're having a ceremony. It's an Efundula ceremony. Efundula is uh, a, nobility, um, uh, a nobility ceremony. <coughs> Do you know what the word nubile means? You know what nubile means. Everyone knows what nubile means, but you know what it really means? What is it from? It's from a Latin word, nubile. It means to, to marry. Someone who's nubile is marriageable. The word nubile comes from the Latin word nubere. Nubere means to marry. So we're saying very nubile. It is a new bar. It is a new bar. New bar means marriageable. Marriageable. Looks, age, everything about this woman, young woman, is marriageable. So it was a nobility ceremony. A ceremony which was a, a rite of passage in which these uh, young women, girls really, they're only teenagers, were becoming instructed in uh, the mar in, in in marriage, actually, and passing through this with dancing and drumming and lessons and so forth. About, and at the end of it, um, they had a certain coiffure and uh, flowers and certain markings on their face. And it was, um, it was they were new, actually newborn at that point, or they had passed this nobility. And um, so becoming newborn, they, they, were, they were then fair game so the guy could meet them, marry them, and he would have a, a field hand for life, which is the object of a lot of marriage in Africa, that you get someone, basically marry them, and you have a worker. It was in the same place where the woman said, well, which one, which piece of chicken, you see? So the downside is the chicken was uh, had covered with flies, and I had to uh, make it a little hygienic before I ate it, but I ate it. Uh, that's the downside, eating the chicken and the bucket of flies. The upside is the Efundula ceremony, which I didn't witness it you, uh, as an outsider. I could, but they told me about it, and I heard about it, and I, I took pictures of them. I had them on my cell phone, of the pictures of uh, girls of anywhere from 14, 15 years old, and very just androgynous, very skinny girls. The man, they said, take their picture. So I did. Anyway, that encounter, which was the car broke down, the guys were drunk, which piece of chicken, the drumming, <laughs> the nobility ceremony is a chapter in the book. And I thought, this is one of the best things, things that has ever happened to me in my traveling life. Not the chicken, but the whole experience. The chapter's called Three Pieces of Chicken. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's beautiful, and it's such an amazing chapter in the book. It's such an Thank incredible you. 
telling. And I, as I was reading it, I was thinking of many, many different things. But it was, it's a perfect metaphor for what happens when you travel. Your, your car breaks down and you think, oh my god. I'm in the middle of nowhere, this is a disaster, and then something magical happens like that. Yes. How, how do you, as a writer, what, what's going through your brain as that's happening, and are you recording everything? Are you frantically taking notes? Are you thinking, this is great material, I've got to get this? I'm just wondering, in the moment, what's going through, what's happening in your head? In the moment, it's, it's survival. You think, uh, am I going to get robbed? Am I going to get beaten up? Am I going to get kidnapped? But the last book, I've, have you, any of you read The Lower River? Yeah. Okay, quite a few, what? Well, I don't know, third of you. The Lower River is about a man who goes to Africa because the village that he goes back to as a former Peace Corps volunteer was the place where he was happiest in his life. His marriage breaks up, and he thinks, I'm going to go back where people like me and where I'm happy, uh, where I was happy. And so he goes back, and he, he, he he's, walks into a trap. I highly recommend the book. The paperback is, is out. <laughs> Whenever you always have to be somewhat wary of that um, the the worst might happen to you. You're among strangers. You're vulnerable. You know, I'm a very conspicuous person, I suppose, in, in some respect. I'm there. They could easily have taken advantage of me. Rob, rob. So simple to rob someone. Just hit them on the head or take their stuff. You know. What I mean. Uh, so you think, what's going through your mind? It is not. American literature, I can tell you. <laughs> it's your, um, you're thinking, why is that person uh, there watching me? What, uh, if I sleep in the car, um, will they, will someone try to rob me? <coughs> Not that, it, uh, in Dark Star Safari, I was in a place, and I remember, um, I was on a truck, and there were shifter bandits there. There were, there were shifter from Somalia, and they, they were shooting at the, at the truck. And uh, uh, the guy next to me said, you know, Fanya Nini Bana, what, you know, what's up? And I said, Sidifuna uh, Kufa, I don't want to die. He said, you know, they don't want your life. They want your shoes. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know what I mean? They're not necessarily, why, why is anyone going to kill you? They're not going to necessarily kill you. They want, they want something from you. They, want, they don't want your life. That's trouble. What they want is your money, your shoes, your shoes, brother. You know, they want your shoes. People with no shoes, they're in the northern Kenyan desert with skinny camels and guns. And the truck just kept going. You remember it from uh, Dark Star Safari. It's, uh, I'm in northern Kenya going from the Ethiopian border down into Kenya. You know, people say, oh, I was in Kenya and uh, you know, we saw a rhinoceros, I think. Oh, but go north of Archer's Post. Go up near the Ethiopian border. You weren't there, you know. It's a bit like um, people say, I, tra I love traveling in the States. Well, I've been traveling in the States. I've been, I've been in Alabama, Mississippi, among other places. You know, parts of South Carolina look like Zimbabwe. Parts of Alabama are extremely poor. You know, they face the same problems that um, that people do in third world countries. HIV, access to good health care, access to hospitals, and so forth. So what's going on in your mind is you think, I want to remember this, but also I have to uh, maybe preserve my, <laughs> my safety. So it's, a lot of things are going through your mind, but, but writing isn't one of them. <laughs> I think writing, uh, the writing, we remember things when we're nervous, when we're worried, when we're insecure. People said to me when I, um, when I wrote my BS, book about V.S. Naipaul, Sylvia's Shadow, how did you remember all those conversations? I said, I remember them because I was so nervous. Every time I talked to V.S. Naipaul, has he come yet? Probably not. <laughs> anyway, he made me nervous. But when you're nervous, you're an animal. You're, you're, you're remembering, you're, 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 you're thinking, uh, there's a shadow here, I'm remembering that noise, if I hear that noise again, I, you feel threatened. Mm -hmm. So that's a mnemonic, um, that it's an animal instinct to remember when you're fearful. So I knew that I would be able to, um, to write what was happening to me, I was just waiting but time to pass. You know, I, knew that I thought, I'll never forget this. There are certain things that you do not forget. And you don't forget them because of this heightened sense of awareness 
that all, all threatened people feel. So that's an aspect of, uh, I suppose it's an aspect of the creative process, you know, fear, uh, uh, nervousness, um, uh, this heightened sense of awareness, all of that combines to, you know, I mean, so many writers are ner nervous, sort of um, agitated people. They're not big, confident quarterbacks. You know? <laughs> Jack Kerouac was a uh, football player. He was called uncoachable. <laughs> he won the, um, the, he made the winning touchdown in that Lowell Lawrence football game in uh, Thanksgiving Day 1939. So he was an athlete, but he was a very, <laughs> he was a very, he was an accomplished athlete, but he didn't have an athlete's uh, confidence. And he uh, got a scholarship to uh, Columbia and then basically dropped out of the program. I'm saying that because <laughs> that you could say, well, Kerouac was an athlete. How did he become a writer? And I think he was a, he had a nervous disposition. <laughs> uh, in, in the Africa book, quite unusually for you, you decide not to complete the journey that you had set out to complete. And I'm wondering how, how you feel about that now, and if it's changed your sense of yourself as a, as a traveler or as a writer. I had a vague sense of, um, I, first, it wasn't that I did complete the journey. You, you take a journey and it's, the journey is the journey. It's, it, it, it's what was meant to happen. I had hoped to go to uh, Timbuktu because of the name. How many of us go to places simply because of the name? It's a, you know, just the name, Zanzibar, Fahia, I don't know, Rio de Janeiro, Tahiti, Bora Bora. You hear a name and you think, I want to go there. I said, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a place called Pacific Grove. You know Pacific Grove? Stand back from there. Pacific Grove is one of the most beautiful names, Pacific Grove. Far Rockaways in New York. Not a beautiful place, it's a beautiful name. There's a, I wrote uh, The Tower of Travel, and I, I mentioned in The Tower of Travel how there are names of places. They don't live up to their names, but they're beautiful names. Shepherd's Bush in London. It's a horrible place. But it's a <laughs> Can you think of a more beautiful name than Shepherd's Bush? Shepherd's Bush. It's just a, you know, it's a, it's a traffic-ridden place with kebab stalls and people scratching themselves voluptuously. <laughs> but Shepherd's Bush. Anyway, so Timbuktu. Timbuktu. Uh, Timbuktu has been on the traveler's map since Ibn Battuta. Anyway, um, I, I got to the north of Angola. In the course of this trip, three people I knew died. Three people I met died. The, my, my book is, um, has a number of de violent deaths in some cases in it. People I met, people I knew. I thought I have to go. You can't go from Angola easily into the Congo. There's no road. So I thought I might have to fly. I don't like, didn't want to fly. I wanted to stay overland. Then Cameroon, Gabon, Nigeria, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso. And I thought each of them posed a different problem, but there were two big problems. One was Nigeria. In northern and northeast of Nigeria, there's a group called the Boko Haram. Since I started recording this, Thousands of people have been killed by Boko Haram. Do you know what Boko Haram means? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Western knowledge forbidden. Western knowledge is forbidden, exactly right. Western, so you look like I do. I mean, I'm a walking forbidden person. So people have been kidnapped, killed, murdered, beheaded, tourists have been kidnapped. And then, and then Nigerians, the Christian Nigerians from the South, have had a very hard time because of Boko Haram. And that's, you know, that's a, a situation that you can't, I don't want to put myself into. There are people, young, desperate, slightly crazy journalists, say, I'd like to go and I'll try it. And there was a time when I might have tried it myself. But now, you know, what what would be, what's the payoff there? That I made it through, what's there to write about? That I survived it? Um, that's not something I really wanted to do. I, it's not a, I took, I've taken risks in my life, but that's not what I wanted to take. And then, 
At the same time, Ansadin, which is another Islamic um, uh, fundamentalist group, I don't, it, I mean, Mali is a wonderful Islamic country, but there's this subgroup of separatists who are the Ansadin, who had divided uh, Mali, and I thought, they captured Timbuktu. It's only, it was only liberated by the French a matter of months ago. So after being captured, you know, when I was taking my trip, so I thought, I can't go to Nigeria. The Congo was in chaos. There were elections there, and there were uh, massacres and riots in the Congo. Uh, trouble in Nigeria, trouble in, how could I go? You, know, you, you say, well, I'm lucky to have got this far. Uh, three people I know have died. And a fourth, a woman that I met in South Africa was murdered by her husband. That's a footnote to this book. Four people um, died. I don't, you know, you, whenever you travel, you think of your mortality. Why do they have, you know, if you, if you say, are you insured when you go away? <laughs> Airports used to have this insurance form, you know, I leave all my earthly goods to Sylvia, whatever it is. Um, so I thought, I've been very lucky in my life, in this trip, I've had vivid experiences. This could be a book. I'm just going to um, turn the page, uh, go back, uh, count my blessings, and and write it. So I did. If if your your question was, did I mind uh, or how did I feel about not achieving it? Sorry that I couldn't. But on the other hand, a lot of travel resembles proctology. <laughs> With the same, you know, equipment, you just, you, you fit it out like a spelunker, going into a cave. Except, you know, you're going into the entrails of the earth. So it's this proctological aspect of going up through the entrails of a place. And what do you find? You find what a proctologist would find. Anything to write about? Maybe nothing to report, except you know, <laughs> an excremental. Vision. I don't mean, you know, there are people who specialize in that. There are proctologists. They have a tale to tell. But that's not my line. That's not my line at all. And you need to be an obituarist. If you're writing an anatomy of melancholy, uh, I don't want to do that. That's depressing. It's the same old tale. To go from one place to another. Oh, it was awful. Oh, it was awful. Oh, it was like proctology. I don't want to do that. I would like to be, you know, retain my hobbit-like disposition and discover something new. I'm willing to go to a lot of trouble, even proctological trouble, if, if at the end of it I have a, something rewarding, a, a, something to discover. If there's something to discover, um, I'm happy to discover it. But if it's, if it's only darkness, cloacal darkness, uh, count me out. I'll just go to Hawaii. <laughs> Sit under a palm tree and read a book. <laughs> You're such a romantic. <laughs> uh -oh. I get the sense that you're still optimistic about Africa. In, I'm not pessimistic because Africa is a big, green, empty, you could say unfinished land. If it was so depressing or if the future was so bleak, why are there so many people going there to try to make deals? Either deals with governments, why are the Chinese there? I mean, there's probably, at this moment, a half a million Chinese, maybe a million, I don't know, not being a couple of doing things, running copper mines, growing tomatoes, making cinder blocks in Namibia, making uh, uh, roofing tiles, uh, uh, making deals, gambling. Uh, I mean, the, the, lots of, why are they there? Why, if China is the country of the future, why are they in China? Why? Are, so we said, I'm not. I worry about the planet. Seriously worry about the, the planet. I mean, you live to a certain um, age, and you look around, and people say, "Oh, things are great," and you say, "You know, it didn't used to be like this. It wasn't like this. You could park a car on any street. There weren't there weren't um, parking meters any, anywhere. There wasn't traffic everywhere." Uh, food tasted differently. I sound like the good old days, but the good, there were. It would, when when I was born, there were 150 million people in the United States. Now there are 330 million people in the United States. Does that make a difference? Well, you can't explain it to somebody who's 15 or 20, but to someone who was born or, or was aware in 1950, when the population was 150 million, this was a different country. 
It was a, a smaller a population, self-sustaining. And I think, I, I mean, it, it seemed to have different possibilities. So, so I'm not, I mean, Africa's obviously um, growing in population. I can't, I'm not a futurologist, but I started this, when you're answering a your question by saying, seeing things as they are. If you see things as they are, the other upside of that is you can, without knowing it, you can predict what will happen. The truth is prophetic. You don't have to be a science fiction writer. You don't have to be a futurologist. All you have to do is describe things, a writer, describe things, a city, a community, a conflict, just describe it as it is, and you will, without even realizing it, describe what's going to happen. Because there is prophecy in all truth. And truthful writing. This is why bad writing is BS and not worth listening to. And why great writing, good writing, has an element of prophecy in it. And it's, you know, it's why people are still reading Shakespeare. They're still reading Chekhov. They're still reading Dickens. They're still reading Mark Twain. They're still reading Faulkner. You know, it's because they were telling the truth about what they saw. I don't know what's going to happen in Africa, but I always feel that if, that in travel, if you write about what's actually happening, I have a reputation for being a little breezy at times. You know, oh, how can you say those things? I know. <laughs> but actually, I'm merely describing what I see and what's happening to me without without editing, and I'm not producing cupcakes for a travel magazine by <laughs> you know, the sort of cupcakes that travel magazines publish, which is, you know, uh, brunches in Waikiki, or the wine tour down the Rhine. I, I mean, it, it, that's not my line. It, 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 if you're taking a vacation, that's a great thing to do. That's not my line. That's not what I'm doing. And so I don't know what's going to happen in Africa. But um, when I traveled in China in 19... 86 and 87, I kept seeing conflict. Student demonstrations, people being beaten up, police really putting the elbow on people. And uh, <coughs> I remember my publisher said, you know, this is kind of, are you, did you see that, well, what's this all about? And I said, well, that's what I saw. In the hinterland, not in Shanghai, not in Beijing, but in, in the smaller towns, it was, Fang Lijiu was the uh, physicist who was head of the democracy movement, anyway. So I thought, I don't know, but I, I keep seeing people being hassled. I don't know why they're being hassled. They're having demonstrations. I don't know what, what it's all about. 80, 1986 and 87, hassle, hassle, hassle. The book was published. I got terrible reviews. Negative, what, negative, how can you say these things? It's awful. The Chinese are our friends. They're making stuff and, they're, and for us. And, you know, Chairman Mao, and they're reforming after getting over the Cultural Revolution. Yeah, yeah. Look at the reviews of writing the Iron Rooster. Look at them. Universally down on me, 1988. But June 1989 rolled around. And what happened? All anyone had to do was look at my book, and they would have seen the seeds. I didn't know that, it was, that Tiananmen Square was going to happen. But, but I saw everything that led up to it. And instead of editing myself and saying, well, there's a demonstration here, I suppose it'll pass away, I thought, no, I'm going to notice everything. And I began to see a pattern without realizing where it was leading. And this is, you know, it's what a, a traveler or a travel writer should do. Say you're traveling in Europe, and you see, I mean, when I was traveling in Africa, in, among people who had nothing, people were rioting in the streets of Athens saying, we, you know, we, <laughs> give us money. And they turned out 45 billion to bail them out. Give us money. Portugal, they were rioting. Italy, they were rioting. Greece, they were rioting. I'm beginning to think, maybe there's countries where people pay their taxes and countries where they don't pay their taxes. And maybe the countries where they do pay their taxes and, and, and there's fairly good governance, those are the countries of the future. And, if, and, and the countries, the non-taxpaying, poorly governed countries, are the places that are going to go down the gurgler, you know? Maybe you can divide it like that. Japan, okay. Germany, okay. United States, okay. Canada, okay. Other places, not. You know, according to, are they paying up? Are they just observing the basic uh, rules of, of uh, civil society? And, you know, it, 
that's something, as a traveler at ground level, that's something that you learn. I saw, uh, I'm gonna end with this. I, I was in, um, in Honolulu, and I met, it was uh, last spring, I believe, and Joe Stieglitz, you know, Joseph Stieglitz, he's a Nobel Prize winning economist. Well, it turns out that he's my vintage. Uh, we're both educated in Amherst. Um, and he was, I was talking to him after his talk, and he said, uh, I, he said, where have you been lately? I said, I was in Angola. He said, I was in Angola. I said, what was it like? He said, oh, we had a great time. I gave a talk and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> what happened? He flew into Luanda. He gave a talk. Everyone loves him. He had his Nobel laureate laurel wreath on his head. <laughs> he said, what did you do? I said, I took a shit bus from Namibia into Nova Florida. I got insulted. Um, my identity was stolen in, in Namibia. Tens of thousands of dollars ripped off. Effondula ceremony, proctology, three pieces of chicken, little bank But privately I thought, he doesn't know where he was. Yeah. I do. <laughs> I, 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 great guy, won the Nobel Prize, you know. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't. But, uh, <laughs> but he flew in to the international airport, and I went by the back door. And so uh, I think uh, if the two roads uh, diverged in a yellow, <laughs> I took the less traveled. <laughs> And it's made all the <laughs> Yes. Um, so w one quick announcement I unfortunately have to make is that in, in 15 minutes, I actually literally, literally have to walk out of the bookstore into a car and go to San Francisco airport because I'm flying to Namibia. <laughs> so, that which seems fitting somehow. But um, I'd like to, uh, let's see, have a few questions from the audience and then I apologize for my rudeness that I'll have to take off. But yes, sir, in the blue, sure. Um, you have been highly critical of foreign aid to the African countries, and people have been very critical of you uh, because of your views. Uh, Having gone through all this, uh, what are your thoughts today? Have you changed them? Or what is your current thinking on foreign aid to the African countries? That's such a, it, it, that's such a, um, you all heard the questions, what my views about foreign aid. In general, um, at best aid um, isn't quite as harmful, uh, isn't always harmful. Uh, there's, there, there are just money pits where people just pour in it. There's an essay by Henry David Thoreau called Reform and the Reformers. It's uh, to the effect that people who want to change the world, who set about fixing the world, have in their past something in their personality, something in their lives that need to be fixed. He said this is a characteristic of a reformer. There's something that they need to fix in themselves. I met people in Greensboro, Alabama, a place that could use a lot of help who had children in Zambia, helping people in Zambia. Now, Greensboro, Alabama is a place that was written about by James Agee. Uh, it's a place that I highly recommend. It's a, it's, a, it's a lovely town. But Martin Luther King gave, made three secret visits there. Race relations aren't great there. Uh, and so, in terms of aid, it's strange to me that we're closing libraries there are potholes and roads. There are schools that need to be fixed. There are hospitals that are closing. There are high uh, HIV uh, uh, rates in the United States. The infant mortality rate in the Deep South is very high. And yet, we're building schools in Afghanistan. We're in AIDS uh, programs around the world. And, and this outreach to countries which aren't even off, Namibia is one. We give $67 million a year to Namibia to um, aid them in their tourist 
industry to uh, through the Millennial Challenge Grant. Namibia gets $350 million in aid, and very few American tourists ever go to Namibia. And if you ask the Millennial Challenge, as I did in my book, why do we give $350 million to Namibia, $700 million to Ghana, $750 million to Tanzania, they will say, it's good for us, it makes friends, they have to pass it, you know, it's good, they have to pass good governance and so forth. In other words, um, explain, I said, well, okay, don't explain it to me. Explain to a main lobsterman why we give $750 million to Tanzania. Don't explain it to me. He said, friendship. Main lobster will say, I get up at 4.30 every morning, my stern man wakes me up. Some days, I, I, uh, gas is so expensive, I don't make any money with my lobster. It's good governance. He doesn't care about good governance. In other words, don't explain to a liberal, or in my case, a flaming liberal, why aid is good. Explain it to a working man why we're upgrading the uh, uh, 67 million, upgrading the website for so that Don George can go to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 50 years ago, Mike Marlin, who's in the back, and I, we're in a teacher training program in Malawi. We were training people to be students and, uh, and hoping that they would become teachers 50 years ago. What do you suppose the Peace Corps is doing in Malawi now? They're training students to be teachers 50 years later. Why? Why? Does that make any sense at all? Why after 50 years aren't there plenty of teachers? there because they come here, because teachers are poorly paid, because the country is badly governed. So how do I feel about aid? I, do, I deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. But in general, I'm skeptical about it. And I worry about our country. But next to a war, the trillions that we spend on war, it's nothing. It's what we give to Ghana or Namibia is a drop in the bucket. They, could, they spend that in a morning in Kandahar. You know? So it's all, it, it's relative. But how I feel, still, I'm still an aid skeptic, and I'm not the only one. If you talk to, there's a uh, Kenyan economist called James Shikwati, read him. He's against it. Uh, Devisa Moyo, she wrote a book called Dead Aid. She's against it. Uh, she, she, there needs to be, a, you know, another answer to it. So it's not me. I'm just, a, you know, <laughs> I'm just a dog sniffing around, looking, you know, looking at things and writing things down. I'm not an economist. but. Where has it worked? Where has it worked? You know, I think someone read Thoreau, Reform and the Reformers, and you think that the psychology behind it is very interesting. The people and the countries that want to aid. Why would someone build in in a country, South Africa, which has diamonds, gold, natural gas, and more millionaires and billionaires that you can shake a stick at? Why would an American? build a school there. You tell me. I have no idea. Other than it sounds great, it buffs up your image, and there's something in the life of that person that needs to be rectified. Why would um, an Irish pop singer <laughs> take Africa on as, as a mission? I mean, there's something, it's the high contrast, black and white, uh, people thanking you. Why does that happen? Uh, or engineering the job. I mean, these are all just, just oh, oh. George Clooney is an ambassador in Darfur. George what? Clooney? <laughs> it's a thing called the World Food Program. They give food aid to Zimbabwe, North Korea, India. India gets food aid. Did you know that? India is, a, is an economic competitor with ours. We give food to India. Why? <coughs> because it's tribal people. And high caste Indians don't want to give food to tribal people. So, this big food program. Who's name an ambassador to the World Food Program? Um, uh, uh, Obama has, you know, head of the World Food Program. An ambassador, the world, Drew Barrymore, <laughs> is an ambassador to the World Food Program, which gives food to North Korea. Okay. Would this make you skeptical about aid? <laughs> yeah, it's me. Anyway, so it's another subject. <laughs>
I really, I really admire your commitment to overland travel, particularly, and um, the way that I've done most of my overland travel has been by hitchhiking, um, which a lot of people think is something that doesn't happen anymore. But I always tell people that it's actually safer now because I can uh, send like a, I can, I can text message a picture of somebody's license plate, which didn't happen in the '60s. Um, so I'd be curious to uh, hear you speak to people's perspective that travel has gotten more dangerous. Um, in, and, and that uh, it was safer in the past, because I think that's a fallacy. In some places, it's much more dangerous. Uh, um, Henry Wharton Stanley, um, in, in the 1870s, walked from, San, uh, from Dar es Salaam um, through the Congo and went down the Congo River. Uh, a man called Tim Butcher tried to follow the footsteps of Stanley in the footsteps of his popular theme in travel writing, the footsteps of Gregor Green or Somerset and all He found he couldn't do it. He could not follow. And uh, so he couldn't follow the footsteps of a 19th century explorer because in, in some cases, uh, they, there, were all, there were barriers, but there's, um, people are much better armed. I mean, at that time, they had spears and you know, simple guns. Now they have AK-47s, and so there are certain places that are much more dangerous, much more dangerous. During the Angolan Civil War, two million landmines were laid. Can you imagine a country with two million landmines? Do you know what happens to landmines in the rain? They slide. So you could say, oh, we put a landmine here, but then when there's a flood, the mud pushes it sideways, so no one there are no animals in, in, in Angola. There are no wild animals. Did you know that? There are no elephants. There are no lions. There are no giraffes. There's nothing. There's an animal called uh, the giant sable antelope. There are about a dozen of them. It's the national animal, so they're, they're in a preserve. There are no wild animals. Why? They've been blown up. They've been eaten. Let's suppose you wanted to walk through. David Livingston walked through Angola. He walked from east to west, then west to east. And on, on his return trip, he stumbled across Lake Victor, uh, 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 Victoria Falls and described it. Try to take the Livingston expedition, say in the footsteps of Livingston. You couldn't do it. You'd be blown up by a landmine. So uh, things will, yeah, it's probably safer in some places. Um, in probably in many places, uh, it's safer. But in many places, it's immeasurably more dangerous. Where are landmines made, by the way? Yeah, yeah, in the United States. The, uh, do you remember, Hillary Clinton was condemning uh, cluster bombs being used in, in Syria. Remember that? How dare they? How could they use cluster bombs? This is a terrible. This is inhumane. Where are cluster bombs made? Wilmington, Massachusetts. Wilmington, Massachusetts, the home of the cluster bomb. What is the area that, uh, so safer? I don't think so. Let's say a cluster bomb, you, there's a 40 acre area, and you said, on oh, at the edge of this 40 acre area, there's a cluster bomb over there. Would you be killed? Yeah. Because a cluster bomb can clear a 40 acre area. It can take out a tank. You think it can take out a person? Yeah, it could. Go to Cambodia. Cambodia is a place where there's been, uh, I saw more limbless, more amputees in Cambodia than I could possibly imagine, because they've been blown up. Vietnam, many limbless people there because of that. So I don't believe, I, you know, countries open, countries closed. I went to Afghanistan, in the Great Railway Bazaar trip, I went through Afghanistan, it was perfectly all right. I just hitchhiked, I took buses, you know, there's people on the hippie trail, they're smoking hashish, fine, everything's fine, guys, was, everyone was carrying an old Enfield rifle, okay, fine, I never saw so many well-armed people, but it was okay. It was not funky, uh, the hippie trail. You couldn't even begin to go through Afghanistan now. So um, at some point in the future, maybe you will, not the near future. So I think that countries open, countries close, but the, but the material of war is more dangerous than it's ever been. And the residue of war, like Agent Orange, in there's <laughs> Bill Clinton went to Vietnam and he said, I'm going to help you with your HIV. They said, 
Forget it. I was when I was in, in, in 2007 when I was in Vietnam. He was there. They said we're not worried about HIV. We're worried about the effects of Agent Orange. We have cancer because in 1967 you dropped uh, Agent Orange on us, and we're still getting cancer. So HIV is a problem, but cancer, you know, affects more people as a result of what you did. And they, they sent him away. Well, he was very humbled by it. And that's why, um, you know, the, the, there are landmines all over the world. And I, there's a, the, I, let me just say in passing, there's a trust called the Halo Trust. It's in Scotland. They're committed to uprooting landmines. Uh, and, you know, it's uh, a, a worthy effort. Anyway, on that depressing note. <laughs>